every manuscript that we have of the New Testament is different from one another. So how exactly do scholars go about determining the original wording of the New Testament? Well, today I'm going to give you some of the basic principles that underlie New Testament textual criticism. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Gospel Training Ground. My name is Ryan Haynes and I am here to help you live out your Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And if you have any comments, questions, or subjects that you'd like me to address, just go ahead and leave me a comment in the description box below. But today, we're going to continue talking about textual criticism. Now, what is textual criticism? Well, textual criticism is the discipline that scholars have to engage in when they do not have the original copy of a document any longer, but they only have copies of that document and each of those copies differ from each other in one way or another. Now, this is something that is true for pretty much any ancient writing. Um, none of the originals exist, but we have copies of those originals. And this is also true of the New Testament. We do not have the original writings of Paul or James or Matthew or Luke or Peter, but we have our copies of those originals. And the thing is, each of those copies differ from each other in one way or or another. They do not always have the exact same wording. And so scholars have to engage in textual criticism to be able to determine what the original reading of the text would be. But then the question comes up is like, okay, so you have all these different manuscripts of different wording, like how do you go about determining what the wording should be? How do we know which reading is the correct reading, or more importantly, which reading is the original reading? Well, today I'm going to help try to bring some clarity to those answers by laying out what some of the foundational principles are of New Testament textual criticism. And these are also the principles that I'm going to be using in my textual criticism experiment that many of you have heard about. And if you haven't heard about it yet, check it out. I'll leave a YouTube card here at the bottom of the screen somewhere. But basically in my experiment, what I am doing is replicating the transmission process of the New Testament on a much smaller scale. And then I'm going to also engage in textual criticism of a document using just the copies that have been made of that document to attempt to reconstruct the original writing of that document. Again, if you want to check it out, click the YouTube card below. Now, before we discuss the exact principles of textual criticism, we have to talk about what the goal of textual criticism is. The goal of textual criticism is not not to try to reconstruct the writing as we want it to be or as it's easiest to read. The goal of textual criticism is to find out what the original writing was. The goal is always to go back to the original. That's what we want. And especially when it comes to biblical studies, we want what the original authors wrote because that is what was inspired by God. All right, so let's start talking about some of these principles that New Testament scholars use. Now, the first and most important principle to understand about this is that each variant, each different reading we find in the New Testament is unique, and there's unique factors involved in bringing about those different variants. And so the first rule of thumb is to understand that there is no one single rule of thumb or one single principle that can be unanimously applied to all textual variants in order to determine what the original reading was. Every variant is unique, and every case is a special case. There are many, many principles to be applied here, and remember, these are principles. These are not hard, fast rules. Now, when these principles are being applied by textual critical scholars, they're always being applied to two different kinds of evidence that they are examining. The first type of evidence is called external evidence. The second kind of evidence is called internal evidence. When examining external evidence, we are appealing to other existing manuscripts, other early versions of the Bible, and other quotations of the church fathers. These are things outside of the text itself. This is what's known as the hard data or the material evidence that we have to examine. Now, the internal evidence is different in that the internal evidence appeals to what the author was most likely to have written or what the scribe was most likely to have done while he was copying the manuscript. Now, these two types of evidence, both the internal and the external, should never be separated. They both need to be compared along with each other when deciding a reading. And no one should ever try to uh, decide a reading solely based on the internal evidence at the exclusion of the external or based upon the external at the exclusion of the internal. Both really need to be brought together before determining a reading. And if you want an example of how this works, you should also check out my video on the textual variant in Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 2, where I explain how it is that we know what the original reading would have been, and I'll put a link for that down here on the screen as well. So now let's get into some of these specific principles. Principle number one, 
Generally speaking, the earlier reading is to be preferred. And the reason why is because the New Testament was copied successively. That means there was an original, and then there were copies made of that original, copies made of that copy, copies made of that copy. And when you have successive copying going on, it's more likely that the earlier copies are reflective of the original more so than the latter copies. Principle number two is that generally speaking, the shorter reading is to be preferred. The manuscript evidence that we have of the New Testament shows us that scribes had a tendency to expand the text of the New Testament rather than to shorten it or to remove things from it. In fact, the majority text, which is based upon much later manuscripts, is actually much longer than the most ancient witnesses that we have of the New Testament. This shows us how scribes tended to expand the text and add things into the text over time. This is due to what scholars often call expansions of piety, which is where the scribes would add their own clarifying thoughts into the text to help it make more sense to the readers. And a perfect example of these expansions of piety is the textual variants that exist in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. The King James Bible in Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but do walk after the Spirit. Now the King James Bible was translated from the Textus Receptus, which is a Greek text based upon the latest uh, manuscript evidence. Not the earliest ones, but the later ones. These are the ones that are longer and more full. But when we examine all the manuscript evidence, the earliest witnesses do not say what the King James Bible says there. The earliest witnesses simply say there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is what we find in all the modern translations of the New Testament. And interestingly enough, when you go back into the manuscript tradition of the New Testament, you see that the early earliest witnesses have it simply put, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but over time, those extra thoughts began to be added in gradually. And it's easy to understand why, because a scribe looking at that could think, man, if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, well, then we don't have to live a holy and godly life at all. And so they took the thoughts that are included later on in the chapter of Romans about walking not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, and they inserted them in there to help bring clarification to the readers so that they wouldn't take Take advantage of their justification and live in sin. But again, the manuscript evidence of the earliest witnesses of the New Testament show us that what Paul originally wrote in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 is simply that one bold statement, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the third principle is that generally speaking, the more difficult reading is to be preferred. It makes a lot more sense to assume that the scribe would try to correct the original writing by making it a little simpler to understand than to try to take something simple that he's copying from and make it more difficult to understand. So scholars tend to accept a more difficult reading over a more simplified reading in a certain text, especially if the more difficult reading is older. And now the fourth principle, and this is a big one, is that generally speaking, you want to try to choose the reading that best explains the rise of the other readings. If there are multiple variants in a single verse and those variants are not nonsense errors or spelling errors, then there must be an explanation as to why the other variants emerged. So if there is a reading that explains the existence of the other readings, then that reading is to be preferred because only that reading could explain why the other readings came into the manuscript tradition in the first place. And I think the textual variant in Mark chapter 1 verse 2 is a perfect example of this. And so I would encourage you guys to check out my video about that textual variant. I'll put a link down at the bottom of the video here. But just to summarize and explain right now, let me give you a brief overview. So here's the thing. There is a very, very important textual variant in Mark chapter 1 verse 2. The vast majority of existing manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of Mark say this in verse 2, as it is written in the prophets. And then he goes on to quote Malachi and then he quotes Isaiah. However, the earliest and most reliable and, and important manuscripts that we have of the Gospel of Mark say something different. They say, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, and then he goes on to quote Malachi and quote the prophet of Isaiah. And the way we can determine the original reading is by looking at which one of these variants explains the rise of the other variant. Let me explain. You see, here's the real issue. The earliest witnesses that we have of the Gospel of Mark have the second reading. But attributing these two quotations from Malachi and Isaiah to Isaiah seemed like a mistake to the early scribes because you're attributing the quote to the wrong prophet. So it's likely that scribes recognized this and perceived it as an error and so changed it from saying, as it is written in Isaiah, to as it is written in the prophets. And this eventually became the predominant reading in the transmission of the Gospel of Mark. 
But if Mark originally wrote as it is written in the prophets, that would not explain why so many early witnesses to the gospel of Mark that are even geographically widespread say as it is written in Isaiah. Because how would all those different scribes make the exact same mistake in the exact same place and attribute this to the wrong prophet? But if Mark did originally write as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, that does explain why so many early witnesses have that reading and it also explains why so many later witnesses have as it is written in the prophets because those people were trying to correct what they perceived as an error. But now this raises a big question. If we determine that the original reading of Mark 1-2 says as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, is that a challenge to inerrancy? Um, did Mark make a mistake? Because let's be honest, he's attributing a quotation from Malachi to the prophet Isaiah. What do we do with that? Actually, this is not an error. It was actually common back in those days when quoting from two or more authors to attribute the entire quotation to the most prominent of those authors. And since Isaiah was one of the major prophets and Malachi was one of the minor prophets, it makes sense why this quotation would be attributed to Isaiah rather than Malachi. Mark was simply following common cultural practices, and so there really is no mistake being made in Mark chapter 1 verse 2, even though it appears that way to us. And now the fifth principle by which scholars determine the reading of a text is to consider the general reliability of the manuscript that contains the variant. If the manuscript under consideration has lots of nonsense errors and spelling mistakes and other problems with it, and it, it tends to not agree with what's generally believed to be the reading in other verses as well, then that's what's considered a low-quality manuscript. It's possible that the copyist making that manuscript was in a hurry, or having a bad day, or maybe had poor eyesight, and so these kinds of manuscripts are, are given less authority and less weight when determining a reading of a variant. So for example, if you had one reading that was found in a few very high quality manuscripts and yet a different reading that was found in a bunch of very low quality manuscripts, the reading of the higher quality manuscripts is generally going to be preferred. And the sixth principle is that generally speaking, you're going to want to choose the reading that is geographically widespread. Remember, the moment the apostles wrote the letters in the New Testament, those things began to be copied and spread widely. So we've got manuscripts from Europe, Asia, and North Africa. So if you've got two different readings in a particular verse, and one of those readings is found in manuscripts from all those different geographical locations, while the other reading is only found in one or a few of those different geographical locations, you're generally going to want to prefer the reading that has a greater geographical distribution. Other readings that are only found in one particular location are probably mistakes that were made in copies in that location and continued to be copied in that location. And now the seventh and final principle I'm going to share with you guys today today is that you cannot always rely on the majority. You might think that majority rules when it comes to deciding a textual variant, and on the surface that makes sense, right? Like, if most manuscripts say this, then that should be how we decide what the original is. Nope, not exactly. The majority of Greek manuscripts that we still have today are much later manuscripts, most of them coming from the 10th to 16th century, and the majority reading of those manuscripts does not always align with the reading of the earliest manuscripts. So the majority reading that we have today is not necessarily representative of the majority reading that would have existed in the 2nd, 3rd, or 4th century of Christianity. And we know this because the earliest manuscripts do not contain what we have today as the majority reading, and also the early church fathers show no familiarity with what we know today as the majority reading. So before siding with the majority, you have to keep these other principles in mind when determining any reading for a textual variant. So hey, these are some of the principles that are used by um, biblical scholars to determine the original reading of scripture. And these are the exact same principles that I'm going to be implementing in my textual criticism experiment. And it's an experiment where I am simulating on a much smaller scale uh, the transmission of the New Testament text, and then I'm going to put into practice these principles of textual criticism where I attempt to perfectly reconstruct a perfect original document using only imperfect copies of that document. And so if you want to learn more about my experiment and more about textual criticism and how to defend your faith in our secular age, then I would encourage you to subscribe to my channel and check out some of my other videos as well. But until next time, keep learning and keep sharing your faith.